Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, Manoj Kulval, uh, and thank you for uh, uh, taking the time to join the workshop today where we are going to be talking about best practices for assessing operational risks and controls. Uh, and this is a series of workshops. So it's basically a training session of six hours, which we've divided into three sessions, uh, which we'll do uh, today, tomorrow, and then uh, day after tomorrow. So in terms of uh, my introduction, so I am co-founder and chief risk officer here at Risk Spotlight, where I've been uh, for the last uh, eight years. Uh, I am very passionate about uh, risk management as a business management tool. So I don't see risk management as a regulatory or a compliance tool, uh, but uh, I, I look at risk management as more a business management tool on how we can uh, run our organizations better, how we can define uh, better strategies than our competitors uh, and execute those in a better way. Uh, in terms of the industry initiatives where I have participated, I have been part of the UK delegation uh, when uh, the revision of ISO 31000 standard was happening. So ISO 31000 is one of the uh, international standard on risk management, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it during the course. Uh, but I, I, I got the opportunity to be part of the UK delegation for that course. Uh, in terms of specifically on operational risk, I was part of the team uh, at Institute of Operational Risk. Uh, where uh, when IOR was creating the certificate of operational risk management. Uh, so this certification yeah, is available to anybody who wants to uh, take an exam and demonstrate that they understand the, the basic concepts uh, of operational risk uh, in case you know, that can help them you know, get better jobs or if they're new to the operational risk role, uh, then it can be really useful to demonstrate your credentials around your operational risk understanding. Uh, at Risk Spotlight, I have also designed the world's first forward-looking operational risk content service uh, called the Risk Spotlight Portal. Uh, and this is utilized by many financial services organizations now for their horizon scanning uh, and monitoring emerging uh, uh, operational risk topics. So while there are a lot of content providers like ORX and IBM Algo and SAS, they only provide content on loss events, which are backward looking. But when you're doing your risk assessment, uh, you need content of what may happen on a given risk uh, in the future. So you can incorporate that uh, into your risk assessment or when you're building your scenarios. So, so that's where uh, the Risk Spotlight portal can be used uh, for uh, identifying yeah, what are those emerging trends and topics you need to incorporate. Uh, then uh, over the last uh, five, six years, I've trained yeah, over to, uh, 1,200 operational risk professionals, either through your yeah, classroom training uh, or online courses. Uh, so if you're if you not connected, then that's where my you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, and please do connect. And if you want to yeah, interact uh, and collaborate on any operational risk related topic, then always open uh, to, the, to those sort of collaboration. Okay, so in terms of risk assessment, uh, risk assessment yeah, uh, takes away a lot of resources. It it's normally takes a lot of time, a uh, lot of resources in any organization. So let's start with what is the purpose? That why do we have? Why do we invest so much time in assessing our risk? And and the way I see risk assessment is that risk assessment is basically a measurement exercise where what you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to measure key variables related to the risks you've identified. So you can determine risks that require either escalation within your organization, or you may identify risks uh, where uh, the existing controls may not be adequate and you may have to change the existing controls or you may have to introduce new controls, or you may, uh, uh, you may want to monitor those risks very closely because their risk exposure may be changing quite significantly in the coming uh, weeks and months. So you may want to keep a close eye on some of those risks. Okay, So that's where I see risk assessment is mainly a measurement exercise where we're trying to measure so that we can, if we have 100 risk uh, in our organization, we can try and identify what are those four or five critical risks so we can then focus our effort uh, on those critical risks. And then uh, the output of risk assessment should help facilitate effective management of any business aspects or business components like your strategy. So if your organization has set out a strategy, risk management should help achieve that strategy. Uh, if there are certain objectives uh, the organization wants to achieve, then risk management should increase the likelihood of the organization being able to achieve those objectives. Uh, same thing around processes, that keeping our processes running, make sure our people are able to contribute uh, to their core business activities, and also then protecting all any assets we own uh, from 
uh, malicious uh, stakeholders inside or outside the organization. So those are the two aspects or key purpose of what I see from a risk assessment perspective. So it's measuring, and then once you've identified your important risk, then using that knowledge to run your business better. A, visually, this is how you can, uh, uh, this is how yeah, I can present that, where on the left-hand side is where you would identify the risks. Uh, and then once all the right risks have been identified, then as part of risk assessment, you are measuring. And that's why you see some of those circles are becoming bigger because the, then the bigger size here is representing a bigger risk exposure. So that's what you're trying to do in risk assessment, try and figure out what are those key risks. And then on the right hand side is where you will be able to see once you have measured, you'll be able to then separate out and find out which risks out of those, the ones you identified require any escalation to senior management or board or your risk committee, which risks require any remediation actions where uh, the current controls may not be adequate. So you have to go and change your control environment or there may be some risks where uh, they, uh, the existing control environment may be adequate, but you may want to go and monitor uh, some of the risk uh, closely over the coming uh, time period. Okay, so that sort of is how visually the input to the risk assessment exercise is making sure you've identified all the relevant risks, because if you don't identify the relevant risk, then you may miss out uh, any important risk, which may then uh, become a blind spot for the organization. And then the output is the prioritization of the risks on, on the right hand side. Then uh, a common question I get asked is when should we assess risks in our organization? So I wanted to just put some trigger points uh, that if these were the, these things happen in your organization, then uh, that's where the risk profile of your organization may change that you may be bringing new risks into your organization or the likelihood or impact of your existing risk may change on these different trigger uh, points. So that's what I want to flag here that what uh, when it happens, should you go and assess your risk? So the first uh, important trigger is whenever we're making any uh, big decision. So if we are thinking of outsourcing an IT system, we're thinking of launching any new product, or we are uh, starting a significant business or IT change project, then in each of those cases, it is possible that you may be introducing new risks into your operational risk uh, profile or operational risk register, or you may be changing the exposure of those existing risks. So it becomes very important that you consider those risks as part of the decision-making process. You don't want to go and make the business decision and then you think about the risks because then it may be too late and uh, whatever investments you, you may have made in terms of implementing that business decision may go, get wasted or you may have to then spend a lot more money uh, on implementing that business decision. Okay, so that's one place when you're making uh, those business decisions. The second is when uh, an organization is defining its business strategy and objectives. So if an organization is setting a strategy to grow revenue by 30% in the next three years, then as part of that, you want to consider all the operational risk exposures that may prevent you from achieving that strategy. So, so if your IT systems are really old, uh, then trying to grow by 30% is, is not going to work because your infrastructure may not be able to support that growth and then it'll become a roadblock in terms of executing that strategy. So you wanna think about those operational risks right at the point of defining your strategy, defining your objectives, rather than you know, uh, deciding on the objective and then worrying about operational risks later. The third trigger is when you are developing and analyzing any scenarios. Uh, and in scenarios, I mean both that you may be considering risk scenarios, but business units, the first line is also considering scenarios uh, a, a lot of times. So, so I'm, I'm looking at both the business and risk scenarios. So, so one of the scenarios may be, what if three of our top three key third parties face business continuity issues at the same time? So if that was to happen, then what are the operational risks we need to consider where the exposure of those operational risks may change or we may not have enough controls to be able to manage the consequences uh, which may emerge uh, from that particular scenario. Okay. The next one is if anything significant happens within your internal business environment, then uh, that also signals that there may be some change in the uh, risk exposure of your organization. So if four of the top five senior sales executives resign unexpectedly over a one week time frame, that may 
point out that there may be some issues on why the senior executive have left in such a short duration. So from a risk perspective, when something like that happens, you may want to go and look at the risks associated with that business unit and see if the risk profile of uh, th uh, that business needs to be reviewed and updated uh, based on uh, wh whatever yeah, the other causes uh, were for that particular uh, change. Then you have, uh, if something significant happens within the external business environment uh, of the organization. So if the government increases the terrorist threat level in your country from low to high, then uh, in light of that, you may want to then go and review any related operational risks in your risk register and see if uh, you need to change the likelihood impact or maybe strengthen some of the controls uh, you have in place around those specific risks. And then the last one is when you need a point in time view of risk exposure. So, so this is where most organizations do their periodic RCSA, where they assess their risk once every year or they assess once every quarter. Uh, and that gives you a point in time view that there is no business driver when you're doing those risk assessment. It's like getting the servicing of your car done once a year, you know, and then you may find out some issues. Uh, uh, so that's how sort of I see periodic RCSA that you're not doing it for a specific business purpose. You're just trying to take inventory, take stock at a given point in time uh, to see, okay, what is our risk exposure looking like right now over the next 12 months or over the next uh, two to three years. And then internal auditors also typically also do assessments like that where uh, they may want to prioritize which business units they want to edit, uh, uh, they may want to audit next year. So as part of that, they may also perform assessment of the risk and use that uh, to prioritize uh, the order in which they may want to audit a certain business unit. Okay, so these are some of the triggers which, if, if, which may change your risk profile. So you should go and assess your risk in order to make sure that yeah, you're managing risks proactively. If risk management has to be effective in your organization, then all of these six triggers uh, need, to, uh, uh, need to ensure that yeah, you go and assess your risk uh, when these triggers happen. Then uh, in terms of when to assess risk, so those triggers which are identified, I just wanted to highlight that that's not just only my view, uh, but that's also what the principles of sound uh, management of operational risk document contain, which was published by the Basel Committee in August 2020. So, so this, is, this is some of the statements you know, from those uh, principles where you can see the first three uh, uh, points there, they're all talking about making sure you're doing your operational risk assessment as part of your strategy development process. And then you also uh, should ensure the bank has adequate process for understanding the nature and scope of operational risk inherent in banks' current and planned strategies. And then the third bullet point is around sound risk assessment allows bank to better understand its risk profile and allocate risk resources and strategies most effectively. Okay, so that those sort of points highlight the integration uh, of, yeah, that we should be looking at risk as part of defining and executing the business strategy. Uh, then there's this another uh, point uh, from the document I wanted to highlight where banks should ensure that operational risk assessment tools output are adequately taken into account in the internal pricing and performance measurement mechanisms as well as for business opportunities assessment. So it's not just the downside of risk, but also, you know, if we are growing our business uh, or if we are, uh, if you want to be profitable by saving costs through outsourcing, then those are all business opportunities and risk assessment uh, out output should be useful for the organization in those cases. Another point I wanted to highlight uh, is uh, senior management should ensure that banks change management process is comprehensive appropriately resourced and include continuous risk and control assessment. Yeah, so, so that sort of is very important because in a lot of organizations, what I see is that there is just a periodic risk assessment and then you do your risk assessment, you do your report and then nobody looks at the risk unless the next risk assessment cycle happens. But, but that's ineffective, right? For, from an effectiveness perspective, you want to look at the risk based on those triggers we, we talked about earlier, that whenever we're making any big changes, any big decisions, something changes in our business environment, so, so the principal document is also supporting that. And then the last one is in general, a bank's operational risk exposure evolves when a bank initiates change. 
and change now is the norm, right? In most organizations that there's always something or the other changing in terms of either our IT systems, in terms of people, in terms of uh, product exposure and so on. Uh, so, so, so operational risk assessment then also becomes very important and understanding those exposure becomes really important uh, if we are to be effective in managing those changes. Uh, and then I've given a link to that document in case you want to uh, find that document. Then I want to share, so if, if that is what we should be doing, what are we doing today? So, uh, uh, so what is the state of operational risk assessment within the industry today? So, so one of uh, the very useful document I found was a analysis done by ORX, uh, which is a consortium of large uh, financial services organization where they shared lost data uh, with each other uh, as part of that consortium. So they did an analysis on the effectiveness of RCSAs in 73 financial services firms who are their members and uh, here were some of the findings of uh, that analysis. So, so the first one you know, is quite shocking that RCSAs don't provide current view of risk exposures. Yeah, and, and that will happen yeah, if you're not doing those continuous risk assessment we talked about earlier, where if you're just doing assessing risk every quarter or every, uh, every year, then of course you're not, when somebody wants to do something in the business and they wanna know, okay, what is the risk exposure? Uh, you'll say, oh, that risk assessment is six months old now, and it doesn't give you the current view of what that risk exposure is. Then over half of the firms were in the process of moving or are intending to move to RCSA approach of combining regular, so those are your periodic assessment, and trigger-based RCSA. So, so that's what they're calling as the hybrid approach, which was basically all those other points we had talked about uh, earlier in the session. But firms who have adopted the trigger-based approach, they found that triggers were typically happening at the request of the second line. Yeah, so the risks are sitting in the first line. We want first line to be looking at those risks. We want first line to be assessing those risks, but they are somehow not interested and we'll, we'll figure out some of the reasons of why that is the case. Uh, but but in, in, in this case, the, in this study, the most of the triggers, it was the second line requesting the first line that oh, something has changed, you need to go and uh, reassess your operational risks. Then uh, there is a perception that RCSA process has become a tick box exercise and firms are not able to use RCSA to support business decision making. So that is really sad considering millions organizations have spent in the last 15 years uh, in terms of uh, operational risk processes, framework systems uh, that we still, you know, in, after 15, 16 years, we're still in this state where we've made RCSA, we've made risk assessment into a tick in the box exercise. And the output of those risk assessments, yes, they may be great for producing the risk committee report, but they're not uh, useful in terms of enabling first line to make the business decisions. Then very few firms reported that the first line of defense use RCSA as a key management tool for running the business. Yeah, so this is where in a lot of organization, first line just sees that, okay, if they get the RCSA from the second line team, they'll copy and paste the last assessment result, change a few things, and then submit that to the second line. There is not any buy-in on uh, understanding the value of risk assessment, you know, so they'll do the minimum uh, which is needed and they're not using those RCSAs to run uh, their business. And then RCSAs are not giving a clear view of control effectiveness. So the first point is they're not giving a, a, a good view of your risk exposure and they're not giving a good view on your control effectiveness, then what is the purpose of spending all the time and effort on trying to do those RCSAs? And then the last three point, uh, so key challenges remain whether your yeah, first line is sufficiently skilled to be accountable and responsible for relevant risks and controls. And I think this is the biggest gap right now where we have not invested enough or organizations you have not invested enough in making sure that risk is part of what the first line is doing. And, 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 and I'm gonna share yeah, some of the ideas of how uh, we can address that, but there's de definitely a big skill and learning and training um, uh, gap uh, in the first line, which needs to be addressed. The uh, another recommendation was the second line needs to step away from executing the RCSA and instead drive accountability and ownership for risk management into the first line. So instead of spending all the time and effort and for doing your RCSA, which you know are only good for that uh, reporting you do to your risk committee, but actually in in real life uh, in in the first line they're not adding any value. 
then maybe there is uh, uh, there, there's question mark on whether we should continue to do that or should we do something different. And then some institutions are moving away from assessing inherent risk and moving straight to looking at residual risk and control effectiveness, which I think is a great move because you already risk assessment is you're asking so much uh, and then you're asking for inherent and residual. So, so that just makes the whole risk assessment process uh, uh, too complicated, too much uh, resource intensive. Uh, so it's good to see that you know, organizations are also moving away and not forcing the first line people to provide input on the inherent risk and just focusing on uh, residual risk because at the end of the day, that is your real risk exposure. That is what matters uh, in, in terms of the exposure after all your current controls are considered. Okay. So, uh, and then I've given a link, uh, uh, I've given a link to that study in case you want to go and read that further. It is, it is really interesting, very insightful, a little disappointing. I was sad for two or three days when I read it uh, because I was hoping we were in a, in a better state than this, uh, but it was, uh, it was not a good reading. Okay, so what are some of the key reasons that if we, if we need to address these challenges, then what are the key reasons? Because if we don't know the key reasons, then of course, yeah, we, it'll be very difficult for us to decide, okay, what do we do in order to fix uh, the current state? So, so the first sort of uh, a, few, a few points I wanted to share was there has been inadequate effort by board and senior management and second line to integrate risk management in the core business activities. And that's mainly around decision making. Because if when first line are making decisions around outsourcing, entering relationship into a third party, launching new products, opening new offices, and if they're not considering operational risk as part of that, and there is nobody who's encouraging them to look at the operational risk as part of making those decisions, then of course, you know, they're they going to go and make those decisions and then worry about the risk uh, later. So, so this is where you know, board and senior managers and second line need to work together uh, to see if we can uh, create that sort of messaging where a risk management is considered as core uh, of all business activity. Yeah, and this needs to go beyond because in, in a lot of organizations I've seen there are lots of posters where everybody is a risk manager, you know, that doesn't work, you know, so that's just funny uh, in, in a lot of organizations. We need to go a lot beyond and then just putting posters uh, across the organization saying everybody is a risk manager. Okay, and we'll, we'll look at some of the approaches in the, in the uh, second and third session on how do we, how do we make that happen. Uh, then approaching a risk assessment with a bare minimum compliance mentality. Uh, where yeah, a lot of organizations just say, okay, what is the little we can get away with? Uh, let's just do that much. And then let's not worry about whether yeah, risk assessment is adding value or not. So, so if yeah, that's what your organization approach towards risk assessment is, then yeah, you're not gonna get all those benefits associated with assessing uh, your risks and uh, uh, your organization then yeah, will not be effective in, in managing its risk. Uh, in most cases, second line focus is to perform RCSA to satisfy board, senior management, and risk committees, and not yeah, facilitating the first line to better understand and manage their risk exposure. So, so, so the second line just wants to collect all the data from the first line, you know, consolidate it, package it, and then present that to the board and senior management, but there is no other interaction on, okay, how is second line actually helping the first line to better understand and manage the risk. So they're only talking at the time of the risk assessment and outside the risk assessment, there is no discussion happening. There's no coaching, there's no mentoring, there's no guiding, uh, guidance happening from the second line on, on the first line because that's not their purpose. Their purpose is you know, just keeping the people on the top happy. Uh, and then you, know, you, you end up a lot of time and then first line is like, oh, you, I did so much work and I didn't get anything out of all that work uh, because that was you know, not the purpose. Then you have a, a single risk assessment methodology is utilized for all risks in all cases, resulting in inconsistent and poor quality data captured during the assessments. Yeah, because each risk uh, or uh, uh, not all operational risks are similar. So a cyber risk is very different to a mis-selling risk, which is very different to an ATM fraud risk. So if you just use one risk assessment methodology for all type of risk, then some, uh, uh, some part of that methodology may be relevant for some risk and may not be relevant for other risk. So, so, so that's one of the things we need to address and we'll, we'll look at the ideas around that on how, where we need to provide a menu of risk assessment methodologies so that depending on which risk you're assessing, you can adopt those different methodologies, which is most appropriate for those risks. 
Then inadequate resources allocated by board and senior management for managing operational risks in the second and first line. Very, uh, the, that's a very, very common uh, uh, concern I have seen where the operas team you know, may want to do the best, but they just don't have enough resources. And there's already so much uh, on the plate uh, that they're unable to do all the right things because they're just fighting fire all the time. Uh, and, and that's a tough one uh, to address because if your board and senior management do not see that need for additional resources or they don't consider that as priority, then it will always be a struggle for the uh, for the second line opera team, and even from in the first line team where they may want to manage resources, improve the controls, but you know every time they go for the budget, they said no by the board and senior management. Then uh, another one I wanted to highlight was assuming that widely adopted practices is equal to best practice. So I want to separate that just because. 80% of the financial services organization use a certain way of assessing risk, that does not mean it's a best practice. Yeah, so it may mean that yeah, it's a widely adopted practice, uh, but definitely uh, it may not be a, a, a best practice. And we'll look at some specific examples of those. And the last three uh, here are uh, human biases, uh, that uh, a risk assessment in a lot of uh, organization is considered as a mechanical exercise. You send out your risk assessment, somebody captures that risk assessment, you get it back, you consolidate it, you prepare your nice uh, risk committee report, present it, and then you rest till your next risk assessment cycle starts. But in all of that, we forget is uh, that there is a strong human element which can influence the, uh, the inputs which are provided by the first line in the risk assessment. Yeah, and similarly, how the risks are interpreted that when you present a uh, risk in a certain way, uh, it, it, the, the report may then get a certain reaction or a certain response. So we need to look at what are those human elements associated with collecting risk assessment data and then communicating risk assessment data. And I've not seen a lot of organizations sort of look at that uh, in as much detail as needed. Yeah, because it's it, risk assessment is treated like a mechanical process rather than something which can be influenced uh, by you know, the people who are performing uh, those risk assessments. And then the last one is just, yeah, just a general lack of motivation yeah, to learn from other industries uh, in, in terms of uh, learning you know, whether we can improve uh, the way we assess risk, the way we manage risk. So there are a lot of good practices in the military, in the space agencies, nuclear power plants, retailers, technology firms. Uh, but still, in my experience, I started in operational risk in the last 16 years, and the assessment methodology which we're using now are very similar to the assessment methodologies we were using uh, 16 years ago. So not a lot has changed uh, in terms of how organizations are assessing operational risk. And then the same one is around learning from other disciplines uh, that we, we focus on operational risk, but then there are lots of other disciplines like complexity theory, systems thinking, decision science, where they're not about risk management, but they are about uncertainty management, you know, which, and then risk is about managing uncertainty. So why are we not learning then from all of those other disciplines? Because they are a lot more mature, like decision science has been around for 50 years. There's a lot of uh, models and tools which are associated on how you consider risk as part of making a decision. And we don't incorporate, we haven't incorporated those ideas in our operational risk management frameworks and methodologies. Yeah. So these are some of the uh, reasons, you know, of why we are in the state. And now if we want to change and we want to get better at assessing our risk, then we need to try and address as many of these as possible, both at the organization level, but also, you know, sort of uh, from a community level that, that we need to address and help each other out uh, so we can learn from uh, the lessons from each other and as a community get better at assessing our operational risks. Yeah. And that's what sort of yeah, we are trying to uh, change, you know, with these workshops is we're trying to bring those alternative approaches. Uh, if you are, uh, if you're intending yeah, to improve the quality of risk assessment, and then as a result, uh, improve the quality of risk management uh, in your organization. Uh, but the ideas I'm going to share, you will only find those useful if you adopt this focus, where if you consider risk management as a business management tool to improve your business better, then only it'll make sense. But if your focus is on complying with a regulatory obligations or your focus is on you know, complying with some board reporting requirement, then of course, yeah, uh, uh, the ideas are not going to help out. Uh, the ideas I'm gonna share in this course. But if you look at those ideas from the perspective of 
okay, can, can these ideas help my organization execute its strategy, achieve its business objective in a better way than we're doing right now, then uh, hopefully you'll find those ideas okay. useful. So the first uh, practice I wanted to share of what we need to change uh, is define risks at the right level of granularity. Yeah. So, so on the left hand side, I'm using an example where technology risk as is the highest level that in your risk register, you could say uh, your risk could be just called technology risk, which will be very high level. Or you, if you were to further break it down, then you could say your risk is called technology failure, which is still high level. Or you could come down and say that your risk is at the IT system disruption level, because from a technology perspective, even CCTV cameras you have is a technology. So, but you're saying that, no, I want a risk which is specific to IT system disruption. So then in your risk register, you can uh, call a risk as IT system disruption. Or if you say, okay, that's also too high level, I want to go a little bit more granular, then you can say disruption to customer facing IT systems becomes your risk, that that's what you document your risk. You know, uh, uh, you can say, okay, when that's high level, we have 20 different customer facing systems. So I, I want to be very specific. And then you can further go granular uh, by saying your risk is disruption to online banking IT systems. But now disruption to online banking system may happen due to a cyber attack, may happen due to a system change. So you may want to say that even that's too generic, I want to go a little bit more granular. And then you describe your risk as disruption to online banking IT system due to cyber attack. And then it becomes a very granular, but a very specific risk in your risk register. So the higher you are uh, in terms of where you're defining risks currently, uh, then you are at a very high level from a granularity perspective. The lower you go, then uh, you're becoming a little bit more specific uh, around your risk. So, so what are the, the ups, the, the plus and the minus, uh, the pros and the cons of this? I have highlighted on the right hand side that if you document your risks in your risk register at a very high level, then of course, yeah, you will get fewer risks. You know? So you may get 30, 40, 50, you know, uh, sort of risks in your risk register, but they will be very high level. And then it becomes very difficult for you to assign risk ownership to those risks. So if I take my risk as, let's say, IT system disruption level, who can I assign that risk to in my organization other than the head of IT? But then he's not necessarily owning that risk or he's not managing that risk from a day-to-day -day perspective. So the higher you are, the more difficult it becomes to assign risk ownership. The lower you go, if I go to disruption to online banking IT system, I know that somebody is responsible for that online banking system. I can find out who that person is and I can make that person as the owner of that particular risk. So, so the lower you go, the easier it becomes for you to assign risk ownership. Similarly, the higher you have, it is very difficult for you to do risk assessment. So if you document your risk as IT system disruption and you have 500 IT systems, when you do your likelihood and impact assessment, which of those 500 IT system that likelihood and impact is referring to? Because then it'll be so vague that it doesn't mean anything to anybody. But if you do your assessment of a little granular risk, so if you look at the disruption to online banking IT system, and then if you do a likelihood and impact assessment at that level, now that likelihood and impact means something because now it relates to something, uh, a risk in real life rather than a category of risk, which is so generic that in real life, you know, that risk doesn't mean anything to anybody. And then first line, they find it very difficult to relate to the risk. So the more higher you go, because the first line, they're working at the process level, they're working at IT system level, at product level. So, so they're working at, with the real risks and the real risks need to be granular at their level. Uh, if, you, if, if you send them the risk assessment with the IT system disruption risk, you know, they may not be, okay, what do I fill in with this? Because uh, in my area, I just have three IT systems. What, what are you asking in, in this case? But if you send uh, an RCSA or a risk assessment with disruption to online banking IT system, yeah, then there's no ambiguity. They'll know that, okay, I can easily respond to this particular uh, risk assessment. And then, uh, so uh, in, in a lot of organizations, the risks are documented at a higher level for the second line, you know, because this is where we've seen that in a lot of organization, the purpose of everything we do in operational risk is to do that reporting. And then of course, the fewer risks you have, the easier it is for second line to aggregate and uh, create those reporting for the senior executives. But the downside of that is you made life difficult for your first line to now manage those risks. 
Yeah, because if you go granular, then yes, you will get to the real risk. It becomes easier for the first line, but now second line needs to do a little bit more work in terms of aggregating uh, those uh, detailed risk and uh, create the reports uh, to present that uh, to the board and the senior executives. Yeah, and if you're trying to do that, yeah, in Excel or PowerPoint, then yeah, it is really difficult. But there are lots of systems out there with reporting capabilities now where it should be a lot easier to aggregate those granular risks. Yeah, so 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 in terms of improving that, if you want first line to be a little bit more participative, a little bit more involved in your uh, in your risk assessments, then uh, if you are at a high level, then try to go a little bit more granular and, and see if you can get to a level where it becomes very easy for you that if, if somebody reads the name of the risk, it becomes very easy for you to identify, oh, this person is the owner of this risk. Because if you're not able to easily make that connection, then maybe your risk is still very high level where you're still not sure oh, if this person could own it or this person could own it, then maybe you need to define it at a little bit more granularity where you can then assign a specific owner uh, to a given risk. And this was highlighted as a problem in the TSP system disruption uh, incident, uh, which happened in April 2018, where TSP Bank was upgrading the core banking system uh, and uh, it, it, uh, it went uh, bad and uh, the, the migration did not work and the systems were down for, uh, I think, six to eight weeks, uh, but it, for some customers, maybe even longer. Uh, and, and there was a big, uh, uh, big hoo-ha about that, at least here in the UK. Uh, and uh, an inquiry was launched, an independent review was uh, launched by Slaughter and May, which is a legal firm, where they looked at, okay, what went wrong in, in this major uh, change uh, program? And they, when they looked at the, how risks were managed of such a significant change program, they highlighted this as an issue, that the risks they had in their risk register, they were largely generic risk for a major IT transformation program. So they had risks like management stretch, cost increases, reputational damage, which are so high level that if, if you have to like think of, okay, what controls are we going to put in place or who's the owner of reputational damage risk you know, on that project, it'll be very difficult that it'll, it'll always just go to yeah, somebody very senior. And then you don't know who is actually managing that risk from a day-to-day -day perspective because the risks are defined at such a high level. And here is the risk register. Uh, so in that report, uh, uh, Slaughter and May had published the risk register. So they had these 22 risks on the risk register. And you can see the issues. I mean, there's things like design because it, uh, design cost increases, resilience, where the risk itself was not defined. I mean, if the risk is just called customer, I mean, what does that mean to anybody? Then of course, yeah, there is a description here, but then a risk, you should be able to easily understand the risk by just reading the title of the risk. You should not have to go and read a detailed description to try and understand, okay, what is that risk talking about? And some of these things uh, here were, uh, uh, were not even risks, you know, so, so excessive complexity, you know, is a driver, it's a cause of something which can go wrong. Uh, similarly, cost increases is an impact of some risk which may happen. Uh, so, so this was like a mishmash and, and unfortunately, yeah, this is quite common that when I look at the risk register of organizations, it's a mishmash of causes and impacts and events. Uh, and then it becomes very difficult if you were assessing, you know, risks at uh, at, at such a generic level. The second thing then we need to do, so the first thing is yeah, uh, uh, defining the granularity that if you are at a high level, then try and see if you can go a little bit more granular. Second is when you go granular, uh, you need to be able to define the risk or you should have some set of rules and principles that anybody who describes the risk uh, uh, let's say the title of the risk, uh, there needs to be some principles so that we are always consistent that whoever is defining that risk in the organization, if they align with that principle, then we can let that risk be documented in the risk register. If it doesn't meet those principles, then we don't consider those risks. We don't add those risks into our risk register. Yeah. So, so that's where uh, the, your risk register first needs to be consistent and not be a mixture of risks and causes and impacts and control failures and issues. So that's the first point, and we'll, we'll look at an example of that. Uh, but then the second point I wanted to highlight is that those risks need to connect to the business objectives. 
because the first line is not coming into work every day to manage risk. The first line is coming every day to work to achieve their objectives, their, their sales targets, their profitability targets, their market share targets, or they're coming every day to uh, execute their processes, manage their assets. Uh, and if risk management yeah, is not uh, integrated in what they're doing uh, in terms of the day-to-day -day activity, then risk management will always be a separate thing to what they're doing as part of the daily job. And the, the, the reason why we, we have ended up in the current state, maybe because of the Basel definition, because if you look at the Basel definition, the risk of loss resulting from inadequate or failed internal processes, people and systems, or from external event, it missed out a very important word called objectives, which is what the two uh, most widely adopted standard, uh, uh, if you look at the definition of risk in ISO 31000, then it says risk is effect of uncertainty on objectives. So any type of uncertainty, if it was to happen in the future, if it can affect your objectives, then it's a risk for your organization. COSO defines risk as risk is the possibility that events will occur and affect the achievement of objectives. Yeah. So, so you always start with the objectives and then you want to link the risks to those objectives so that you can easily see that, okay, if we don't manage this risk, then here are the business objectives we will not be able to achieve as part of our business plan this year. If, if, if the first line is not able to make that connection, then for them, risk will always remain the separate thing they can park and do later and it doesn't affect what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So to facilitate this, a tool I want to share uh, is a, a tool uh, I've developed called the risk chain, which is very similar to a bow tie diagram. So if you if you uh, if your team has used bow tie diagram, you'll be able to uh, relate to this. Uh, if you have not uh, used bow tie diagrams, then please Google it. It's a widely used uh, tool which is used to understand your risk in a consistent uh, manner. Yeah. So so similar concept here, but I've just added the objectives. So so in this case, you start on the right hand side where you identify your business objective. So you may say that your business objective is to, let's say, grow your number of customers in your retail bank by 12 percent this year. So if that is the objective, then you are uh, the risks would be what events need to uh, which may happen you know, in the next 12 months, in the next two or three years, where if those events happen, their impacts will either help you to achieve those objectives or uh, uh, they will become a barrier in uh, the organization being able to achieve those objectives. So in both the ISO and the COSA definition, a risk is considered to be neutral. Risk is not necessarily negative. So a risk is just an event which may or may not happen in the future. And if that happens, then sometimes it may have a positive impact. In some cases, it will have negative impacts. And then on the left-hand side, once you've identified those events, then you are looking at the causes to see, okay, what causes will need to happen, which will increase the likelihood of that event happening in your organization. And then those causes would start somewhere, either inside your organization or outside your organization. And that's what we call as risk source in this diagram. Okay, so you want to sort of structure that what you put in your risk register as the risk title will be what you, uh, uh, what you call with this blue box, the event. And then for that risk, you'll document the causes, you'll document the impacts, you'll link those impacts to the objectives so that the first line is able to quickly do a, create a report to say that our objective this year is to increase our new customers by 12%. Let me go and see how many risks are associated with that objective and are we doing well in terms of managing that risk or not. So let's look at some examples of how we apply this risk chain in, in some real life context. So first I'm taking a market risk example uh, because uh, in operational risk, uh, there are very few risks which have positive impacts. So I wanted to first show an example which has both positive and negative impact. Uh, and this is a market risk example where an event uh, you will have on your risk register is trending of GBP versus Euro. And if that was to happen at any point in the future, then the positive impact of that event would be that it will reduce the procurement cost uh, of you dealing with any vendors in Europe. Yeah, but the negative impact of that event happening in the future would be that it would decrease the revenue uh, from the European countries after you convert uh, that revenue from Euro to GBP. 
And in each of those cases, those impacts then will affect some business objectives. So the procurement cost will then make sure that yeah, our operating costs come down. So we, we, we could be more profitable uh, if that risk happens uh, from the procurement cost perspective. But from the revenue perspective, if uh, that event was to happen, then it will reduce our revenue. And then uh, that is associated with our revenue objective. So you look on the right hand side, the event, the impacts, and we only then care about the events where the impacts are associated with important business objectives. Yeah, so if they're not associated with any important business objective, then we should not be spending a lot of time on those risks. Then on the left hand side, so what could be some of the causes? So one of the causes of that trending may be Brexit. Uh, and then the source of Brexit is then the geopolitical situation in Europe, that that was the source due to which Brexit happened. And because of Brexit is where uh, the, how Brexit can impact our organization is if this was to happen, yes, trending of GBP uh, versus Euro. So you can't put Brexit as a risk in your risk register. Uh, it's how Brexit would impact you. That is what you would put as risk in your risk register. So that's sort of one example. Then uh, an operational risk specific example. Uh, so like I said, that operational risks yeah, don't generally have positive impacts. Uh, so in this case, uh, I've removed those uh, green circles. So we just uh, focus on the negative impacts. So in this case, you're looking at unplanned outage of online banking system due to cyber attack. So if that event was to happen, then you would have to pay customer compensation. There'll be negative coverage about the firm. Uh, in the media, and there'll be a rise in customer churn that if, if that event happened multiple times, then your existing customers, you know, would not be happy and they may go and leave the bank and join another bank. And in, in those uh, cases, those impacts will then affect the business objectives you may have around maintaining a high level of customer satisfaction, or if there is a business objective on maintaining a certain level of churn uh, uh, of your customers, or if the business, you know, has an objective around increasing or maintaining market share, then those business objectives would get impacted by that risk. Yeah, and then you can easily see why this risk is important. And then the first line will also be able to see why this risk is important because the first line will now get measured on these business objectives. So in order to make sure that they are able to achieve those objectives, they would want to now make sure that these risks are managed, uh, these risks are managed effectively. And then on the left hand side is where then you see the potential causes. So what could be the causes which will increase the likelihood of the unplanned outage? So one of the cause may be that if we uh, use a lot of poor quality hardware or software, then yeah, there may be lots of security vulnerabilities in our, uh, in our IT infrastructure, which cyber criminals can exploit. So if that is the case, then the likelihood of the risk is high. Uh, if our, uh, if our IT team yeah, doesn't have inadequate skills for managing cyber risk, then that's where you know, they may be not uh, uh, thinking about adequate controls or then they may not be uh, purchasing the right systems you know, with the right level of security, which then again increases the likelihood of this particular risk happening in our organization in the future. So you'll identify in real life, of course, yeah, you'll have many more causes and you'll have many more impacts. So this is just an example to give you yeah, how uh, we can utilize the risk chain uh, idea. And then in this case, the source of those poor quality hardware or inadequate skill, maybe the IT team that maybe, you know, the right person is not uh, heading up the IT team that where they don't understand those points, or it may be management where management is not giving adequate resources to the IT team so that they can buy good quality IT hardware and software, or they can go and hire cyber risk expert. So, so those budget constraints may be enforced on the IT team by management, uh, which then, uh, uh, which then increases the likelihood of those causes and uh, due to which then the likelihood of that risk, you know, goes up. Another example uh, we can use uh, is disruption to customer business processes due to unexpected branch closures. So, so that's an event you put in the middle. And then on the right hand side, if that event was to happen, then uh, you, you will have your, your vulnerable customers may, may, be fine, may have to face financial difficulties. You may have to temporarily waive fees and charges for ATMs, which I think as part of COVID-19, a lot of organizations had to do that. There may be a rise in demand for online banking service because if people now they can't go into 
the bank branches, then you know uh, they will all go onto the online uh, uh, online services. And then if the online system is not able to handle that increased capacity, then you may see outages of those online services due to that event. Uh, or there may be a rise in demand for phone banking, resulting in long waiting time for customers and poor experience. Yeah. So those are all the impacts which may materialize if this event was to happen. And those impacts then are associated with, again, the customer satisfaction objective, the customer churn objective, the market share objective. And on the left-hand side, the potential causes of that event could be government lockdowns, as we've seen uh, uh, for COVID-19. It could be terrorist attack. It could be civil unrest. It could be a war. So those are all the different causes due to which we may have to close our branches. Uh, and that may then disrupt the customer-related processes. And then the source of those causes may be a pandemic or geopolitical situation in the world. So, so let's then summarize this point and then I'll look into the chat to see if there's any uh, uh, comments or questions there. So, so what you want is you want, if you want uh, the risks to be documented in a structured way, you want to define some rules and, and then you only put the risk in your risk register if they meet those rules. If they don't meet those rules, you know, then uh, you have to make sure that uh, whoever is submitting the request to add those risks, you know, they reconsider those uh, so that it's aligned to the risk. So, so the, there are uh, two rules in terms of what you do, and then uh, there are some rules in terms of what you don't want to do. So, so the first rule is that whenever you are describing that event, it has to be something which is specific to your firm. So you cannot say terrorist attack is a risk. You cannot put that as a risk in your risk register, but damage to assets due to terrorist attack, yes, that is a risk you put in your risk register. Okay, so it has to be something, whatever you put in that event as the title of the risk, that has to be something related to your organization. It should not be you know, Brexit or it should not be COVID-19 because all those are on the causes side. You know, they are not, uh, they're not risks for your organization. They are causes of risks which may happen in your organization. The second rule is uh, that whatever event you document, that event, if it was to happen, it has to directly result in financial or non-financial impact. Yeah. So, so you can't put inadequate resources as risk on your risk register because nobody is going to penalize you for not having uh, uh, adequate resources. But if due to those uh, inadequate resources, if there are de delays or failures in executing your customer facing processes, then yeah, that's the risk because now then if that happens, then yeah, you may have to pay compensation to your customers. You may uh, uh, face negative publicity into the media. So whatever risk you put into uh, as, as a risk title in that middle, it has to be that if that happens, there has to be a direct, not an indirect, there has to be a direct financial or non-financial impact. And only then it should be considered as a risk. Otherwise it may be an impact or it may be a cause, but it doesn't qualify to be a risk. And in terms of don't, so make sure you don't document control failures as risk. So I've seen in some organizations where risks are defined as inadequate KYC checks or failure of BCM plans. Well, in this case, KYC, BCM, these are all controls we put in place to manage risks like disruption to our IT system, disruption to our business processes. You can't put failure of control as a risk because then your risk register will be risks and all the control failures. And then it's, it doesn't match because then uh, you'll have uh, too many risks and then you are inconsistent in how those risks are defined in your risk register. Similarly, you can't put, yeah, just control. So whistleblowing channel, you know, cannot be a risk in your risk register because that's a control. Uh, should not be a process failure. So you can't put your yeah, poor quality onboarding of vendors you know, as a risk or poor quality IT support. Those are business processes and that, then whatever yeah, can go wrong in those business processes, those are the things we want uh, to be risks and you know, not just take a name of a process and then just put poor quality in front of it. So, so if you apply sort of yeah, these principles, then you can at least make sure that uh, you have uh, documented your risk in a consistent way that when you look at your risk library, it doesn't look like a mishmash of causes and control failures and impacts and uh, an actual risk. Because yes, of course, you know, you, you will have some actual risks also, but that's what yeah, we want to restrict our risk register to have those actual risks and everything else should be supporting uh, the actual risk. Thank you.
component. Okay, so this is the third practice. So the first practice was around defining the risks at the right level of granularity. The second practice was defining the risk in a consistent manner. And then this is the third practice of defining appropriate measures to assess the risk. So, so if, if, if I was to sort of uh, give you a non-risk example, then in real world, if I have to, let's say, measure a distance between something, then I will use a measuring tape. If I want to measure liquid, then I'll use a measuring jar. And if I want to measure the weight of something, then I'll use a weighing scale. So depending on what you are measuring in real life, we then use different methods to measure uh, uh, those particular things. The same concept also applies in risk because not all risks are same, you know, that, uh, so you cannot use the same measurement approach for all your risks. So all measures may not be relevant for all the risks. And then let's look at this uh, by an example where on the left-hand side, I have highlighted four risks and then on the right hand side, I have given an example of assessment measures. And, and assessment measures are basically what do we need to measure so that I will be able to compare uh, that the, the same risk in one business unit is uh, higher exposure than another business unit. Yeah, so that's what those measurements are, that if, that if something was to happen, then you can measure how much fine the regulator could impose on us. Or you could measure if, so, if something was to happen, then how much compensation we may have to pay the customers. So on that right-hand side is where I have listed 12 examples of assessment measures. On the left-hand side, I have listed four operational risks. So now, uh, if, if on the chat, uh, can you ping uh, if we look at the first risk, so damage to assets due to man-made disaster, so like a terrorist attack, which of these measures would be relevant? So I'll, I'll go on chat and keep an eye on your suggestions. Okay, so cost of replacing damaged asset. Yes, that will definitely be relevant. Uh, physical harm injuries to employees, absolutely will be relevant. Then uh, damage to tangible asset, yes. A regulatory fine, I'm not sure about yeah, whether a, a terrorist attack may cause a regulatory fine. Uh, so uh, six, yeah, uh, death of employees, definitely. Eight and nine, yeah, we have covered. Six, we have covered. And then one, of course, yeah, you want to assess yeah, the likelihood. So it's good that uh, Pamela, yeah, you picked up the first one. Because yeah, you also want to assess what is the likelihood of that risk. And then maybe the likelihood of that risk in one country uh, business unit may be different to uh, the likelihood of the same risk in another country. And then we have five illness impacts on employees. Yes, possible. Uh, Okay. Okay, great. So, so that's great. So, so, so you can see that only some of those measures were relevant for that risk. So now let's look at a slightly different risk. So the second one is intentional mis-selling of products and services to clients. So which of those measures on the right now will help us measure and compare that risk? So negative publicity in the media, yes. Regulatory fine, yes. Customer compensation, absolutely. Uh, rise in customer churn. Yes, our customers may leave us if they find out our salespeople are mis-selling products and services to them. Okay. Uh, there may be a drop in share price. Yeah, if it is a significant mis-selling event, and it can definitely impact the share price. Excellent, great. So that's the second uh, risk. Then let's change uh, the, to the third risk. So now uh, something internal conduct related. So harassment of employees by their managers or colleagues. Okay, so the third risk. So, so yeah, harassment can result in physical harm or injury. Yes, illness of employees, yes. Customer compensation, not sure, uh, because it's, yeah, it's more internal. Customers are not involved in that case. Uh, okay, and then uh, regulatory fine, yeah, but because yeah, it is now covered as part of at least your conduct SMCR risk in UK by FCA. Negative publicity in the media, absolutely. And then your likelihood also will be relevant. 
Excellent. Okay. So then change it to the fourth and the last risk. So theft of customer data by cyber criminals. So what would we need to measure in order to understand that risk? So regulatory fine, yes. Negative publicity in the media, absolutely. Customer compensation, yes. Drop in share price, yes, very, very possible. Okay, great. All right. So, so that sort of hopefully gives you uh, uh, gives you the idea that all risks are not same. So, depending on what risk you're looking at, uh, the and, and the nature of the risk, you may have to measure different things uh, within uh, as part of your risk assessment. So, so let me then close the chat window so we can continue our conversation. So in this case, if you put the assessment measures on the risk chain, which we saw earlier, then likelihood goes on the left-hand side. And then all the other uh, measures we talk about, they go on the right-hand side because likelihood is then about those causes that if, we, if those causes uh, were to somehow come together, then that is where the likelihood of that event happening will go up. So likelihood is then measuring the left-hand side of the risk chain and things like regulatory fine, customer compensation, they are all, uh, they only come into the picture after the event has happened and not before the event has happened. So, so that's where, you know, the majority of our assessment measures are on the right-hand side of that chain. So in, in real life, if you were to go and identify all the impacts uh, at the level we have done here, then you'll probably end up with between 30 and 50 impacts uh, for the various type of operational risks we typically have to deal with, deal with in financial services firm. But what I have seen in most organization is uh, we try to generalize, we try to create some high level measures, four to six measures like financial, reputational, regulatory. Uh, and, and this is what, uh, in at least a majority of the organizations I have worked with, the assessment framework for operational risk is something similar. It may not be exact, but something similar where you look, in this case, we're doing a residual analysis where you, do, uh, you have a likelihood which measures the occurrence part of the risk. And then from an impact perspective, uh, you may have a financial scale or reputational scale, customer, regulatory, employees, and then operational disruption. And then each one of those measures then will have a scale defined. So I've just expanded the example here for the financial impact scale, where you say very high is you know, about 250 million, very low is less than 100K. Okay. So this is sort of is a very common framework I have seen, uh, which is used. Uh, and then in this case, yeah, there are just six assessment measures or, or six impact related assessment measures and one uh, likelihood related uh, assessment measure. Then let's look at what are some of the flaws in this approach. Uh, and is, is that the reason you know, for uh, how uh, risk assessments are done at the moment? Uh, and can we do anything to address uh, those flaws? Uh, sort of example I wanted to share uh, or flow I want to share yeah, with this approach is that when we do something like this where we've aggregated 30, 50 uh, measures into just five or six, then whenever you uh, create those high level measures, then it creates a lot of ambiguity in the person who's actually doing the assessment, uh, but also uh, people who receive the assessment output. It also creates an ambiguity for them to know that, okay, what is actually included in the financial impact? That does the financial impact include the legal fees? Does it include the compensation we have to pay to the customers? Does it include the regulatory fine? That it becomes a little difficult if there is just one measure you're capturing for uh, the financial scale. And then this is why it becomes very difficult for the second and third line to challenge the assessment outcomes because in real life, especially the financial impact, it can be really granular that there can be a lot of line items uh, which could contribute to the overall impact. And if you don't know what the uh, person who's performed that risk assessment has included and excluded, then it becomes really difficult for the second line or the third line to look at that and then go and challenge uh, the, the first line on those output. 
So this, I think, is one of the key drivers of why we are getting poor quality information from our risk assessment, because our assessment measures are so high level that the person who may be uh, providing the input may be assuming something and the people who are using uh, the, uh, the outcome of the assessment may be assuming something else. And then there is no consistency in uh, the information which has been captured. And also when you uh, uh, when you try and group multiple financial impacts together into one, then that's where you would generally uh, uh, underestimate the impacts. Because if you were to individually go and list those line items in Excel and then assign numbers against them, you will end up with a much higher number than if somebody was just assessing, you were just asking them a ballpark figure and they've not done that detailed analysis, then generally this is a human bias that uh, we will underestimate uh, the risk because you know, we, we don't think, oh, it can be higher. So we always go a little on the lower side uh, than the actual risk exposure. So this sort of is, is one flaw you know, in the system which we need to address. Uh, and this then further highlights uh, this challenge. Uh, so I, I took the IBM cost of data breach report 2020, uh, which was published by IBM uh, a few weeks ago. So in this report, they, they looked at the data breaches which have happened in various organizations globally uh, over uh, the last few months. Uh, and then they try and calculate how much did the organizations actually lose as part of uh, after a data breach. So, so in, the, in their case, they are separating the financial impacts into these four categories where if you look at the detection and escalation, then that's where they include the cost of forensic and investigative activities, assessment and audit services, crisis management, and communications to executives and board. In the lost business category, they are uh, calculating the business disruption and revenue losses, the cost of lost customers and acquiring new customers, and reputation losses and diminished goodwill. In notification, they're capturing the cost of sending emails and letters and calls, calling the customers uh, to notify them about the data breach, the determination of the regulatory requirements, communication with the regulators, and then involving outside experts to help you to deal with uh, the data breach. And then ex post response is where the cost of help desk and any inbound communications that if you have to hire your extra call center staff to handle uh, the customers who are calling to find out whether they uh, have been affected, uh, the credit monitoring uh, service we may have to provide to our customers, issuing new accounts or credit cards, legal expenditure, product discounts, and regulatory fine. So if you look at the number of line items that we are just talking about one risk here, so this is just a data breach risk we are talking about, and if in our risk assessment, if we were assessing the data breach risk, and if we were just capturing one input that you know the the person who is uh, providing the assessment input they just get one drop down and these are the choices they get then it becomes very difficult for us to know whether if they have selected 10 to 100 million which of these line items have they actually thought about and which are included and which are not included in that yeah and so so this sort of becomes that one challenge on why it may become difficult that you collect your uh, assessment data, but then you can't really use it because you're not really sure what has that person included or excluded when they provided their risk assessment response. The second uh, problem with this uh, approach uh, is that such measures, they only allow one point to be selected from the range. And, but in real life, risks don't happen in one point, right? The risks happen in range. So that's why the, that's the certainty aspect of risk that uh, it, it, just, it won't just happen in one point where you are expecting it to happen. Uh, it could happen in a small way. It could happen in a medium way. It could happen in a big way. And if you look at the example of the IBM cost of data breach, then they're highlighting three cases. So they're saying that if the breach is less than 100,000 records, then the average cost of the breach uh, in organization could be $3.86 million. But if the data breach involves one to 10 million records, then the cost of the breach would be $50 million. If the breach involves more than 50 million records, then the cost could be $392 million on average. Okay. So, so those are highlighting then the different severities at which that risk would happen. But when we send this risk assessment to our risk owner, and now the risk owner is assessing, 
we don't know which of those three scenario is the risk assessment considering when he's responding to that risk assessment. And this can then particularly be challenging if one risk assessor is assuming you know, the lower impact scenario, another risk assessor on a different risk is assessing the higher impact scenario, and then you just get a mishmash of uh, uh, cases or ways in which the risks would occur because you can only capture in this approach the, the person who's doing the risk assessment, they can only provide one input for that risk. And then in real life, if you were to put this on the risk heat map, then your data breach could be on multiple places depending on the severity of that data breach. So if you're talking about that 50 million uh, record data breach of uh, impact of 392 million, then it could go into that very low and very high on your heat map. If you're talking about uh, the one to 10 million breach, then you know that's the very low and high impact is where that would go. If you're talking about breach of uh, under 100,000 records, then it could go in that low and medium uh, intersection. Yeah, so that's how risks work in real life. But the way we are doing the risk assessment, we don't allow that flexibility to the risk assessor. We are forcing the risk assessor that you have to pick one. And then if there is no guidance provided to them on which ones they should pick, then you, you will then end up with a mixture of best case, worst case, somewhere in the medium scenario for the different risks. And then all those numbers we are then communicating in our risk report may all be inconsistent and, and, and may not be valid. Okay, so that's this second, uh, as a second flaw of uh, using this particular approach. Then uh, the third flaw uh, is that typically when we do these risk assessments, we are capturing uh, that what could be the impact over the next 12 month horizon. So that's the most common uh, sort of assessment timeframe organizations look at, that if that risk was to happen in the next 12 months, what could be the impact on the organization? Uh, but some risks, they, uh, the impacts may last over multiple years. You know, they may not, all the impacts may not materialize in the first year. So we've had yeah, cases like the PPI, misselling uh, scan scandal, LIBOR scandal, where those impacts have been unfolding over multiple years. Even if you look into the example of the, the data breach report by IBM, they said that only 44% of the total impact happens in the first 12 months of the data breach. And then the remaining 32% happen in the second year. And then the, the, the remaining 24% happens after the first two years of the data breach. So, so those impacts are happening over multiple time period. And then in the risk assessment, we're not providing any way to capture that because we're just asking for that one number. So is that one number about what could happen in the first 12 months or is that number the cost of the entire breach? And then are the different risk assessors capturing that in a consistent way? Another flaw uh, is uh, that such measures also introduce potential ambiguity on whether the impact should represent one occurrence of the risk event or multiple occurrences of the risk event. So if a data breach can happen three times in a year uh, and uh, the, the impact of one breach is 50 million, then should the person who's performing the assessment, should he uh, capture 50 million for one event or should he capture 150 million to capture that that event could happen three times in the next 12 months? So again, if there is no guidance provided on that, then some assessors may capture just the impact of one event and some assessors may capture the impact of multiple events. And then again, it'll introduce inconsistencies into the risk assessments. Another uh, uh, challenge, so this is not necessarily a flaw, but a challenge of this approach is uh, that such high level measures, they are very difficult to assess for risks where uh, you have mainly non-financial impacts because you have financial impacts, you know, you can at least get close to where you want, uh, but non-financial impact, it becomes really difficult that how are you going to assess things like harassment of employee risk, discrimination of employee risk, illness or death of employees due to man-made disaster or natural disaster or spying off employees by senior executives, that it just becomes very difficult to assess these type of risk with, with this kind of structure. Uh, where yeah, they, they may not be a financial impact, but you maybe you may want to capture a reputational or employee impact. And what do you capture? How do you capture uh, those outcomes that the first line may really struggle 
to provide assessment for these risks where uh, you don't have a uh, financial impact, but they may need non-financial impacts. And then uh, another uh, sort of yeah, challenge with this approach is uh, because you we have different scales uh, and each of those uh, assessment measures are different. So it, it you cannot be sure that the different levels which have been defined, are they consistent across the scale? So, so in the case of financial impact, we, we're saying high is between 100 and $250 million. And on the employee scale, we're saying high is where the risk event impacts 25% to 50% of the employees in the organization, there is no way for us to know whether they are same level or not. Uh, and, and, and this makes it very difficult then when you try and aggregate uh, these multiple measures. So a lot of organizations take like the maximum, you know, of those measures or they take an average of the measure or some sort of a weighting average of that measure. And when you start combining these different measures, then it becomes really difficult that you may then end up with a consolidated score, which then is inconsistent because uh, it's very difficult to know whether each of these levels are at the right level, that what a high in financial impact, is it at the same level of severity uh, from the employee perspective? Okay. And this is where then I'm just summarizing. So uh, due to all the reasons you know, we've highlighted here uh, that this approach is really challenging, that if we try to use a approach like this, uh, then we are going to get, you know, it's just the inherent nature of all the different flaws uh, in this approach, that it will be very, very difficult to get any good quality outcome. Uh, and it will be very, very difficult for a person who is uh, providing that, uh, uh, the assessment inputs, and for people who are then trying to understand, you know, what do those input means, uh, that, and, and this may be uh, one of the reasons of why uh, ORX also highlighted the data quality as a challenge, uh, and then most of you also, you know, sort of flag that uh, as a challenge in terms of data quality, because the method we are using to collect the data has a flaw. So there is a flaw in the process of how we are collecting risk assessment itself. Uh, and, and this sort of yeah, highlights this idea where a widely adopted practice is not necessarily best practice, because this is where uh, uh, the poll also confirmed that majority of the organizations are using something similar to this, and you know, which also is then confirmed by my interactions with uh, many financial services organization that everybody is using this, but in spite of knowing that or, or, or not knowing, and maybe you, you were not aware about some of those flaws and you know, you, you've uh, become aware of those flaws today, uh, but it's not the right approach that there are better ways which are available uh, in order for us to assess operational risks. So what I want to do is just pause on this slide and then we will continue. So we look at yeah, what are the alternative approaches uh, of how we can change the way we assess the risk when we go into the session tomorrow. Uh, but a lot of the ideas I'm going to share, they're coming from these resources. So I just wanted to quickly talk about uh, these resources. So if you recognize that the current assessment approach is not working uh, in your organization, and then now you are keen uh, to improve that uh, on your organization, uh, then you, you may want to go and then yeah, read uh, some of these resources. So, so uh, le let me then just share some of the high level uh, views I have on these resources, and then we'll uh, stop at that point, and then we can continue uh, tomorrow. So, so particularly, I want to highlight the first three resources. So they're all written by the uh, uh, by the same author, Douglas Hubbard, uh, who is excellent. That you need to follow what Douglas Hubbard is doing in in form of this book, and then he's also active on LinkedIn, and uh, he's also yeah, published uh, uh, some videos, not as many videos on YouTube, uh, but. I also used to think for a very long time that it's very difficult to quantify operational risks. Uh, that because you know they are so qualitative in nature, uh, that the only way for quantification is that yeah you go into modeling and capital modeling, and that's only for the statistician. It's not for the first line business people. Uh, but then when I, I came across work of uh, work of Douglas Hubbard, that's where I identified how easy it is actually to quantify the risk by the first line. You know, even though they may not have that detailed statistical knowledge, they can still go and quantify the risk in a lot more granular way than just saying high, medium, low, which is how most of the organizations assess uh, their operational risk as. So, so definitely, you know, must read books in terms of yeah, how to measure anything. That after reading that book, now I'm also pretty confident that if you give me any risk, I can help you to measure 
uh, any risk and quantify any risk and all it'll make without doing any statistical analysis, just using business common sense, business knowledge, we can go and quantify uh, the risks. And, and we'll look at a couple of examples tomorrow of how we can apply those techniques. The, the fourth one on the first row on the top, so that's the uh, guidance on the ISO 31000 standard, uh, which is published by uh, uh, Australian uh, Standard Authority. Uh, so that is also yeah, one of the best guidance available. So it's not a book, it's a PDF document you have to buy, uh, and it gives guidance on how to implement ISO 31000. Uh, but it's, it's, it's one of the best guidance written on how to implement uh, risk management, uh, but then also yeah, as part of that, it also has a lot of good guidance on how to assess the risks in a you know, sort of a yeah, simple and effective way. Uh, the logic of failure uh, is also a great one where it talks about uh, the more complex risk, because we're all now dealing with very complex risk where a cause may happen in one department, the event may happen in another department, and the impacts may be uh, happening in a, a completely different departments. So when you're dealing with complex risks like that, which cuts across back office, middle office, front office, then how do you manage those risks? Because you know, one person or one department doesn't even have the whole view or the whole picture of that risk. So how are we going to assess if we don't even understand the full picture of that risk? And that's where the logic of failure you know, provides a lot of tools and techniques on how do you think and uh, about those sort of risks to make sure that you are able to uh, uh, effectively manage those complex risks within your organization. Uh, on the second row, thinking fast and slow. So that's also a great book in terms of the human aspects of risk management. So, so I had mentioned earlier that uh, risk assessment, yeah, it's not, it's not a mechanical activity, right? It's people are doing risk assessment. People are then reading the output of those risk assessments and people are maybe making some decisions based on that. Uh, so all those human factors need to be considered uh, as part of risk assessment. And that's where thinking fast and slow has lots of great ideas of what to look out for uh, those human flaws, and then how do you address those to make sure you can improve the quality uh, of your risk assessments. The next one is World Class Risk Management by Norman Marx. So that's also a great book where uh, Norman has this uh, talent for simplifying uh, very complex ideas. And he's done that in, in the World Class Risk Management, where his complete focus is on how do you uh, use risk management as a business tool uh, to manage your business better, you know, and then it's not something that you do sort of once a quarter or once a year. Uh, it's something you need to do as an integral part in, in the first line. So another great resource. Uh, the next one is super forecasting. Uh, so, so this one is highlighting some of the attributes of what type of people are good risk assessors because we generally just send our risk assessment to somebody in the first line who's sort of yeah, dealing with that risk, but we don't question, say, okay, is this the right person to be assessing that risk? Uh, and, and that's where in super forecasting, there has been a very detailed scientific study done on uh, different people and what makes one person better at assessing risk and what makes uh, one person not so good at assessing risk. And then they've, they're highlighting sort of your yeah, different attributes, uh, which sort of yeah, will make you question saying, okay, if you're sending a assessment to a person in the first line, is he the right person or should we be sending that assessment to somebody else uh, in, in that particular team or department? And we'll, we'll discuss some of those ideas in the third session uh, when we discuss those human aspects. The next one is uh, Smart Choices. Uh, so that sort of is a book on decision-making that when you're making those big decisions, then how do you incorporate and think about risk as part of uh, that decision-making process? So, so again, a great book from a first-line perspective because that's what the first line is doing every day. You know, they're making all those key decisions. And if we want to embed that they think about those operational risks as part of those decisions, then that's where yeah, there's some great guidance. And then we'll also cover that uh, in the third session. And the last one is Guide to Effective Risk Management, uh, which is yeah, written by uh, Alex and Alina. Uh, so that's also a great book yeah, where it sort of combines just common sense, just looking at risk management from a, a common sense perspective uh, and from a business perspective rather than you know, Basel or Solvency II or a compliance uh, perspective. Okay, so those are some of the great resources if you're interested. So of course, yeah, I'm going to share as many ideas as possible from these books during this series. Uh, but yeah, there's of course a lot more. 
so I, I wanted to make sure that yeah, I also share uh, these resources with you so you can also continue your learning after uh, we finish uh, uh, the workshop series. Okay, so with that, that's all I want to cover in the session today. Um, we will meet again the, at the same time, so one o'clock uh, UK time uh, tomorrow. Uh, and then we'll continue and we'll look at yeah, what are some of the new approaches then we can try to address the flaws I have highlighted uh, today. Okay, so, so with that, thank you very much then for uh, giving your time uh, and attending uh, the session today. Uh, I look forward to yeah, uh, uh, interacting with you again tomorrow and I'll just stay here in case there are any questions uh, then I can address those questions.